this way. Come on, buddy. Come on. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me just take a moment to introduce my good buddy here. Come on, turn left. 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 Walk back with me. Back. 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 Good boy. Mr. Argon. Yeah. Have a seat. Does everybody know what a service dog is? Does, oh, there was a few people don't. I saw a few heads shaking. Let me take a moment to just tell you about Argon and the work that he does and about service dogs. Maybe you know about guide dogs. Guide dogs are dogs that assist people who need help with their vision and they can't see and move around very well. They might be blind. But dogs help people with all other kinds of disabilities nowadays. And I'm Argon's trainer. Argon's my trainer. And I've been training Argon to assist somebody to walk. Right now he's not wearing his brace. The brace is tucked away back there. But when he's working, he wears a brace on his back and he becomes a four-wheel drive walking stick. Right? But I'm not going to talk about that this afternoon. Instead, this afternoon, I want to talk about atoms and molecules and nanotechnology and things like that. So with any luck, Argon's just going to take a little siesta, and I'll get into my presentation. Argon, come on over here. He likes to be with me. Come on, up, up. So the first thing we've got to do is switch from that presentation to the one I really want to show you, which is this one. I titled it Exploring the World of Atoms. And the reason I chose the word exploring is because that's so important to what scientists do. We get to explore the unknown. For me, that's like the coolest thing in the world because I really love discovering new things and understanding things that have never been understood or never been discovered before. That's something that I think is really cool. So I'm going to tell you about my own work, and we're going to explore the world of atoms. Now, there's all kinds of questions that you can ask about atoms. First question I thought I would ask is, who started thinking about atoms and why? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah? The Greeks. I've got a great audience today. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, as far as we know, as much as we've learned from history, it was the, it was the ancient Greeks um, who started thinking about atoms. Um, they were really remarkable scientists themselves. They were great philosophers. And so this is a picture here of the Parthenon in Athens. And this is a famous painting from Raphael. And these are supposed to be the great, uh, Greek uh, philosophers. Sometimes I think this is supposed to be me just taking a little nap on the steps sometime. Right. Why did they start thinking about atoms? They really wanted to understand the world around them. And they started thinking about, well, how small can things be? And, and one guy named Democritus got the idea that maybe there's a smallest unit and you can't make things smaller than that. And, and came up with the idea of, of atoms. And he's very famous for this quote of his, in reality, there are only atoms and the void. In between the atoms, there's nothing but emptiness. So what are atoms made of? And so let's build a carbon atom. And the way we're going to build a carbon atom is from the bottom up. And we'll start off with the basics of the nucleus, um, which is made from protons and neutrons. Carbon atoms are really important. Does anybody have an idea what's so important about carbon atoms? Right. It's because I'm made out of a lot of carbon atoms. Carbon atoms are the stuff of life. Carbon, oxygen, um, hydrogen. They're really important to us. Carbon atoms require six protons and six neutrons, the same number of neutrons as the protons. And then what you do is you just swirl these things together and you make a little nucleus. Well, that's going to be the very center of the atom. So now what we need to do is shrink it down to make room so we can see the electrons that we're going to add. So let's shrink that thing down, make it really small. It's just a little tiny thing there. Actually, I would have to shrink it even more, but then you wouldn't be able to see it. Now we get to add the electrons that form the outer part of the atoms, actually the most important part of the atoms. Carbon's going to have six electrons, just like it has six protons. We're going to add two. These form the inner shell of the, the carbon atom. And then we're going to have to add four more. And these four more are called the, the P electrons. And now we finally have what is a, a carbon atom with a little nucleus right in the center and the electrons um, surrounding it completely. So how small are atoms? If we had five carbon atoms and we just stuck them together in a straight line, they don't actually form a straight line, but suppose we could. That would be about one nanometer, which we learned was a billionth of a meter. But let's see how this compares with something that, we can, uh, that we're all familiar with. So if I were to take those five carbon atoms and shrink them down 
to the point where they were just one pixel wide on this display. Uh, then I could compare a nanometer with a micrometer. A micrometer is a thousand times larger than a nanometer, but it's still something incredibly small. You can't see a micrometer with their, with their bare eyes. So let's take the micrometer and we'll shrink that by another factor of a thousand. You make it really small, just one pixel wide, and now we're up to a millimeter. A millimeter we can all see. It's just oh, about that big. So you can see the gap between your fingers real easily. How small is that? It's hard to put that in, into perspective. How small is a nanometer? So the way I tried to do it was to compare it against something that we all know, the width of our finger. And if you were to just take those carbon atoms and line them up one after another in a straight line, it would take about 100 million carbon atoms to stretch across from one side of your finger to the other. They're really small in some sense. They're so small that you know, 100 million, I can't even imagine what 100 million things next to one another would look like because I've never ever seen that in my life. So why are atoms important? Everything that we see around us is made out of atoms. The molecules, for instance, a DNA molecule, which gives my body the instructions on how to grow and become a human, made out of atoms. Uh, one of my dogs, this is Neon, not Argon, he's made out of atoms. These kids, just like you, made out of atoms. The Earth, it's atoms. This galaxy somewhere out in the universe, it's all atoms. Everything is made out of atoms. And how atoms interact with one another and what are the properties that result when you stick different kinds of atoms together um, is what makes us all different, what is what makes the floor different for me, me different than argon. Uh, but in some ways, we all have these great similarities with one another. We're all made out of the same stuff, atoms. So how can we see atoms? Well, we can ask the question, how do we form in images of small things? Let's not worry about atoms yet. Let's just talk about small things. Anybody got an idea? How do you see small things? Yeah? How do you think we see small things? A microscope. Of course. So let's build a microscope. The first optical microscopes were invented by a scientist named Robert Hooke. And I would love to show you a picture of him, but there's no surviving portrait of him, so I had to draw one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really a good resemblance to the way he must have looked. So he built these compound microscopes with looking through there and discovered all kinds of things. He was the first to image cells. That's a really extraordinary accomplishment. Something that's really important about the way uh, optical microscopes work is they use something called wave optics to magnify something. And the, the light that you use to, to see the object, a light comes as a wave. And what lenses do is they just bend the wave. So they take what might have been, I have to put this stuff down to show you. They take what, what might have been just a, a flat wave moving like this, and they bend it and they spread it out. And what happens is, just like the way my fingers spread out as I let my, my hand represent the spreading of a wave, the gap between my fingers, something small, grows to be something large. That's magnification, and that's just the way that optical microscopes work. Now, optical microscopes are beauties. Here's some old ones here that I'm very fond of looking at. But you can only see down to the, the level of you know, really small bugs or maybe little cells with microscopes like this. And you can't see down to the level of atoms. This doesn't even get close. But there was another microscope that was invented back a little, about 80 years ago by this guy named um, Ernst Ruska. And he was a guy who developed another kind of microscope called an electron microscope. And that let scientists see much, much smaller things than just cells. They could see the things that form the insides of cells for the first time. And that's because it uses waves, but at a different wavelength. And it uses special kind of waves, the waves that electrons are. But the way it works is really the same as the way an optical microscope works. It works by bending the waves and making something that was small large because you could bend it and expand it. And then came along these guys, Gerd Binnig and Heine Rohr in the early 1980s. These are my colleagues from IBM's laboratory in Zurich, Switzerland. And they invented an incredible new kind of microscope called a scanning tunneling microscope. And this doesn't work at all the way microscopes before it used to work. It works in a very different way. Now, I want you to help me. We're all going to make a little microscope. 
What we're going to do is we're going to form an image of our hand, but we're not going to look at it with our eyes. I want you to take your finger and put it on top of your, of your other fingers like this. Okay, and now just move your finger along. And you can feel your finger going up and down as it goes over your other fingers, right? So you can move your finger back and forth and you could form an image of the shape of your hand by just feeling. Close your eyes. You can feel what the shape of your hand is. That's just what these guys did. But they made an instrument that was capable of doing that where it could sense the shape of individual atoms. So the way the tunneling microscope works is you have a metal needle and this is the thing that you want to image. We call that a sample. And we have a robot that allows us to move the tip around very carefully with a lot of precision. If we go and we take a good close look at what's happening at the end, somewhere at the end of that metal needle there are the atoms which stick out farther than all the rest of the other atoms. And that's what this part represents. This is the, the end of the needle. And then this is a surface that we want to form an image of. And it's made out of, out of atoms. So here I've got a plane of atoms that you see. And then I, I drew an atom sitting here on top. This is just a cartoon. This is not a real image. I have a computer control where this tip goes. And I can bring it close to a surface. And then the computer can move this tip along, just like you moved your finger along over the top of your hands. And this tip will follow the contours of the surface. And the computer can draw for you, because it controls it all, where the tip went and how high it was above the surface. So from that, we can get an idea that the surface had some atoms on it, because we can see the individual bumps here. Then what we'll do is we'll ask the computer to just go along and form an image of the entire surface by moving the tip back and forth over the surface, just the way you moved your finger over your hand in different positions. And then when it's all done, it forms an image like this. And these are the kind of pictures that we see, where now every bump corresponds to the location of an individual atom. And what's really extraordinary to scientists is we never could see things like this before. We don't see it with our eyes. We see it with our instruments. But it provides us with a great visual representation of what the surfaces might actually look like if we could see them with our eyes.